Hi folks, hi time for another video on my video blog in general and my little hardware random number generator project, the ARC board, the auditable real random number generator hardware board uh, in particular. And no, I don't want to do something about information theory this time as I'd originally planned but I want to talk about a special chip I've used here which I have to get rid of again which is the FTDI FT232 RL. I really want to get rid of that as soon as possible but first things first in case you wonder why I haven't done or I haven't recorded any video for what four and a half months now hang on I'll tell you a couple of things that have happened uh, at the end of the video but what might be important right away is if you post on the forum or try to post there and it doesn't work, please send me a direct email. Shortly after the last video, I had a tremendous increase in blog spam. And when it hit something like almost 6,000 spams in one day, one Sunday especially, it took me two hours to get rid of this stuff. I decided I don't have another option but uh, enable an automatic spam folder. So if you have any problem with that, no, I'm not happy about it either, but there's simply no other way I could continue to do this. Anyway, about the FTDI chip. What happened a couple of weeks ago, months ago by now probably, was that FTDI, the manufacturer, decided they've had enough of people selling, uh, producing and selling counterfeit chips which cost apparently less than half of what they charge for their genuine ones and decided to take measures. Means they released an updated driver for these chips and that updated driver had the additional functionality that first it checked is the chip connected a genuine one or is it a fake? And if it was a fake no, it's not like the driver would stop working. That would have been too easy. What it did was it would effectively break the chip. And that caused a bit of a commotion. Shortly after they released the driver, they put it into Windows Update. So a lot more people got affected, caused even more of a commotion. And what eventually it turned out was that while the device was mounted in some bigger something like this or even bigger they reprogrammed the product ID. Now every USB device is identified by a vendor ID and a product ID and uh, they are used to select the proper driver. So if you change these you won't find a matching driver. Basically means the device is useless for all practical purposes, unless you know what's going on and how to fix it, which the vast majority of people don't. And I first learned about this in Dave Jones' EEV blog, which is here. And he did quite a rant about it. And at first I thought, yeah, okay, this is really bad style, but talking about corporate suicide might be a bit exaggerating until I realized what it actually means, what it means to all sorts of people. If you're using some sort of hardware that you actually rely on and it stops working, that's not good. And if you really need this device, so you have a spare, spare one in your cupboard, pull it out, connect it, it stops working as well, that's when people might get really, really upset people who have no idea what sort of chip is used in there and where it came from and what's actually going on. So they go to their um, salespeople, distributors, whatever, where they bought this sort of equipment. Uh, they won't be very happy with customers showing you that it's broken, fix it. I still have warranty. And by the way, that thing was expensive. It cost me almost 12 euros or dollars or whatever, something like that. No fun either. Especially so if it's shown to be a serious fault because it happens with all devices, all sorts of these devices at the same time. So they go to their, their upstream distributors and the 
comp the, the, the device manufacturer and uh, they go to their supply people who sold them these fake chips and whatnot. Not very fun. If you think about it, this is really something you shouldn't do if you deal with anything like devices people actually rely on. And the maker scene, who was apparently quite se seriously affected because there are a lot of fake chips like these used on boards all over the maker universe, they were really angry. And those are people you don't want to mess with with because some of them will be the industry leaders in a couple of years from now with whatever they are currently working on. Not good to lose these business, uh, these, uh, these business partners. And what's even worse, they might actually look for solutions that a company might decide, now this is going to take too long and too much money. But these people might actually work on it. And yes, more on that in a moment. Of course, Microsoft apparently wasn't all that happy about it either, because if FTDI did anything, then it was demonstrate what a security issue this, these automatic updates, no matter if it's Microsoft or anybody else, actually are, because they mean that anybody might run into a situation where all of a sudden things stop to work. And not just because some individual bit of hardware breaks, but because there's a driver bug and uh, entire business comes to a grinding halt. So, not very good. And as far as I'm concerned, yes, I was also rather pissed. Partly about myself, partly about FTDI. And why is that? When I first built this prototype, I wasn't entirely happy about the FTDI chip, but it seemed the most reasonable solution for first try and I read the data sheet and I should have read closer. Why is that? Because in the data sheet it says that there is some Windows program you can use to change the product and vendor ID plus a couple of things in the EEPROM in the chip. And for some reason I assumed that you'd have to pull some pin to VCC or ground or whatever so you'd have to put a jumper in there and could only do that with the jumper in place or removed. And that turned out to be a rather silly misunderstanding of mine, because you don't. What it actually means is that anybody who has access to a computer can effectively brick and really brick a device using this chip at any time. That's not good. That's really not good. I mean, at least some sort of malicious software. I've heard these things exist, even outside the FTDI driver universe. And you just look if there is some sort of FTDI chip, possibly see what's actually connected behind, what it's uh, built into, and just break that thing. Cool. Excellent. Now, if there is one way of security issue that I'd have to explain with this or if there's one if I had to explain a security issue a hidden security hole in devices that would be a great example for how to do it in hardware so that's why I decided aside from all the other trouble about FTBI actually possibly going bankrupt on this which I guess might actually happen this chip has to go because it's a security issue. And that made me go back to before I designed this first version of the board. Well, second, the first one was breadboard. And think about why did I choose FTDI? Why did I choose it despite its limitations and disadvantages? And what other alternatives are there I have considered but not pursued any further. So I might uh, track back to there. First things, first off, things I don't like about the FTDI chip. It's an SSOP28, which means it's a 28-pin chip the size of my small fingernail, roughly. 
also means the pins are spaced so closely that with the average soldering iron tip you're supposed to use to solder these, you touch four of them at the same time. These are scary. No, there's no dip package for these. There's not even an SOIC package. And I think that's rather bad news for a project where one of the goals is to actually provide a blueprint, blueprint or empty PCB or whatever for people to build them uh, the entire boards themselves. Didn't have much of an option. And um, why 28 pins, by the way? USB has four pins plus shielding. Okay, fair enough. And a serial interface has two pins TXRX, it needs ground, and two pins for handshake, plus, I uh, should probably need my, use my toes for this, plus voltage and maybe another ground connection. So you can easily fit it into a 14 pin package rather than 28. Makes it much easier for people to use. Reason here is that out of those 28 pins, four are effectively unnecessary already. This one at least that's not connected and I think three redundant ground connections. So not very, very convenient. And then there's all sorts of features in there that you don't really need for status already here, status already there, a test pin that nobody knows what it's actually there for. Another thing I don't, don't really like from a security point of view. And um, basically it means it's got features that nobody cares, nobody really knows about apparently, and that just require extra pin. And of course, with additional features nobody needs, it doesn't really help to lower the price. These things are simply expensive. My usual uh, distributor I go through here in Germany is Reichelt, one of the bigger ones here. And uh, if you have to mail order things anyway, they are pretty reasonable and they don't charge you an arm or leg if you just order things for 20, 30, 40, 50 euros or so, like DigiKey does. I think they want something like $65 or even euros shipping and handling if you order for less than 100 euros, something like that. Um, anyway, I paid about three euros for these and I paid less than one euro for the microcontroller I use. So these things aren't cheap. And at least according to Dave Jones and a couple other people, a major issue with them is also the availability. Because every once in a while you find that FTDI is out of stock, that all the major distributors like DigiKey and Mauser and Funnel and whoever are out of stock and then you start to buy from wherever you can get stuff. And if you have an order for some hardware you build using these chips and uh, you don't get the chips, you have a problem. What are you going to do? So in that respect, FTDI is also part of the problem actually, because they can't, don't manage to have things in stock when people need them. Anyway, why did I actually use the stuff? And the first one has to do with not the product ID, but with the vendor ID, because if you build um, a USB device, you generally need a vendor ID to identify your device and then the product ID you assign yourself so the proper driver gets loaded. Problem is that the USB mafia, um, um, sorry, the USB uh, implementers forum wants 5,000 US dollars for a stupid vendor ID. And uh, they call themselves non profits, yeah, but whatever. Anyway, just for a home project or for experimental stuff, spending that money on a vendor ID is not much an option. And with these, they have they are pre-programmed with an FTDI vendor ID, and you're all sorted. And even if you didn't have to pay for the vendor ID, you'd have to get the drivers installed. FTDI has drivers for their chips in all major operating systems. Windows, Mac OS, Linux, the BSDs. I think I've seen one on Solaris, but couldn't be bothered to check all sorts of stuff. And because they're so widely used, it can be reasonably sure they are mature. And that's another reason to use them, better than writing drivers yourself. 
and you don't even have to ship uh, driver CDs with your products and write some sort of documentation how to actually install them on a computer. Writing documentation for people who are barely able to turn on and off their computer anyway is a bit of a challenge, at least a lot of work, if you want to do it properly. And of course these chips are tremendously popular, they're used all over the place, so people are familiar with them. And if you're not familiar with them yourselves, there's a good chance you can find somebody you can ask who's already used it before. So all in all, despite all the disadvantages, that's why I used this chip. And now it has to go. So what I need to do next is decide what alternatives do I have. And good thing is I've been kind of investigating a few of these beforehand a couple months ago or what a year ago or so and I still have a couple things in mind and a couple ideas what to consider next. First option is there is a similar chip from a Taiwanese company called Prolific and you've probably seen their drivers all over the place uh, before problem with those is they're even harder to get than the FTDI chips and apparently they're even more expensive as well. I looked around, Reichel didn't have any, Funnel didn't let me in because apparently because I'm using Tor and I'm not going to change my security policy because otherwise I can't do business with them. That's their decision as well as mine. Um, TGK I think didn't have any and Mauser had one QFP32 package for six euros something or so. So twice as expensive as the FTDI stuff. Not that enticing. Another option I've taken a look at, where is it? Is something uh, Stefan Wahl of the uh, EKIX sent me. This is a little um, crowdfunding project. It's uh, called the DigiSpark. It's an Atmel ATtiny85 8-pin microcontroller plus some extra stuff on a USB connector, basically. And you can run something called VUSB on there. VUSB is a software-only implementation of the USB protocol. And, well, as you see, I never actually bothered to use it for anything. Well, played around with it a bit, but didn't really use it. Why is that? Because VUSB does everything in software on a 20 megahertz microcontroller. It just doesn't have the performance. It only does USB 1.1, which isn't fast enough for my purposes. And, well, what do you expect from a 20 megahertz uh, microcontroller bit banging protocol like USB gigabits per second not much of an option nice thing and these things are probably very nice for things where you don't need bandwidth and USB to zero but not for my purposes other thing I took a look at is a microchip MCP 2210 which is an SPI to USB interface chip it's at least available in SOIC 20, so it's much easier to solder, for, or less scary to solder, I should say, than SSOP. And I got a couple of those, never really tried them, because when I started to do a bit of research on them, actually, I learned that apparently they're a pain in the ass to program for, and you need drivers and all sorts of stuff. So, yeah. I might actually give them a try at some point, but not right now. Other thing I came across, and I actually have them lying around here, a couple PIC microcontrollers. After all, I'm not of this religious kind of, you shall not have any microcontroller, but beside me, whatever sort of stuff. Um, PIC has the PIC 16F 14 54 55 59, which are these, come in 14 and 20 pin dip packages, which was the reason why I bought these. And they have built in USB. That's cool. 
So these are these are an immediate candidate for the project, so I can get rid of the FDADI stuff and use USB right on these. Except this is an open source, open hardware, fully auditable design where it's supposed to be. And the problem is the one pick programmer that is supposed that it's supported in open source software is the Picket 2, that's the thing in here, this one. And the Picket 2 doesn't support these chips. Bummer. Yes, the Picket 3 does, but the Picket 3 is only supported by microchips, uh, proprietary closed source programming environment. And for this particular product or project, that's simply not an option. Aside from the fact that I'm not overly happy having to use Windows for my projects. Apparently there's a, my, uh, an, a Linux version as well, but I've, I don't know if that works with the Picket 3. So that was a bit of a problem, but Pick also has, or Microchip has a couple other slightly bigger 20 pin dip package microcontrollers, the Pick 18 F 13 and 14 K50. And they are supported by the Picket 2 and apparently, I have to check that, they are supported by the one open source compiler available for the PICs, which is SDCC, the Small Device C compiler, only they generally say PIC support is work in progress. So we'll see if I can get that to work. However, if I can, things might get interesting. Of course, I might do away with the Apple chip on the on the board and just do everything in the pick. But what I really want to do first, not for this project, but in general, is to take the pick chips and see if I can make them into a serial to USB interface. I guess there are other people who want to get rid of their FTDI chips and their designs. And if I can actually program the PIC chips to do this, that might be something helpful to other people as well. And if there's enough people who are interested in it, I might actually even go for a USB vendor ID and start a little business out of it. I don't know. Maybe somebody else is already working on this. I don't know. So if you know about this, do me a favor, leave, leave me a comment so I know that I don't have to bother. Anyway, if that works out, I might also consider using the PIC chip for the entire job. And I might also consider using another microcontroller with built-in USB support for the job, like an, I, some, some of the Atmel ATX Megas or some MSP430s I think have it and some STM32s have built-in USB. Problem there is they usually show up in QFP packages or something like that, which is really scary for non-professionals to solder at least the first time you try. So we'll see. I'll try the pick stuff first. And um, I guess once I got that figured out, if it works or not, I consider the STM 32s quite interesting because there are some really fast ones around there. See how much I can actually get out of the analog part of the design. But there's another thing that's worth a bit of thought. Does it have to be USB? After all, USB is a pain in the ass interface and it has its slew of security issues itself. So what if I do away with it? What options are there? Well, I used to muck around with the Maxim Max 232, which is a TTL level UART serial to RS-232 voltage level interface. And of course, that means I need an RS-232 interface on the computer, which you get in with these. And these little USB to, to, to RS-232 dongles 
they usually contain another Max 232 or similar on one side and a Prolific or FTDI chip on the other side. So it's a bit weird to go back and forth and back and forth. But yeah, nothing else that might actually be an option. I've been making, messing around with these before. However, there's yet another option and that's do away with all the microcontroller and whatever stuff and just connect things to for example a Raspberry Pi which has GPI opens so I connect the output of the amplifier stage right to that and that's all I need plenty of options so big question is where do I start and uh, what should I try first I'll go for the pick 18s and see what happens Anyway, that also means I have to redesign this board, which is what I had expected anyway. And what this looks like oops, is what this looks like is basically this, like this. Let's see if I can show this properly. So this is the entirety of the design. I have a USB interface connector. And I draw some power and reference voltage basically to the linear black section, which is first a step-up converter. So I get the necessary voltage for the generator core, which contains the avalanche diode or xenodiode doing avalanche or avalanche diode called a xenodiode or sold as a xenodiode because I need the higher voltage there. Feed that into a single transistor amplifier stage which uses the voltage it gets as a reference voltage so it knows basically what voltage range to stay in. Feed that into the microcontroller which is currently an ATtiny 2313, smallest I could get with a serial interface. That goes a uh, UART interface TTL level serial into the FTDI chip which then communicates back to the FTDI chip. This one has to go. The question is why do these have to be separate chips? So what am I going to do? I'm going to redesign this black section as a separate board and I will go SMD again or go SMD for a change because I want to see how small I can get it and eventually there should be a through hole board and an SMD board for people who are more or less comfortable soldering. I mean I've been told there are people using blowtorches for soldering and they, these probably shouldn't be confronted with SMD. And for the rest, it's back to the breadboard stage. Not nice, but well, that's how it is. And after that, or parallel to that, I still want to work on some testing tools for these things and um, well yeah aside from that of course as you probably guessed I'm a little busier right now than I used to be and as I promised a couple things that happened since late summer first off I've got a pretty much full-time project basically means that while I was doing mostly trainings until sometime this year so there'd be a training would be really busy and afterwards there'd be some kind of time to catch up with things the time to catch up with things is currently filled with this project and a lot of things you could actually tell that I've just pushed things to later on and later on I never have never found the time to do things so sort of thing that was a bit unexpected in hindsight, it was obvious this would happen, but I'm adapting again. So I guess there'll be a few more videos uh, to come in the near future. Another thing that happened uh, was the right meeting in early November. Now, I'm not going to tell you like hundreds and thousands of other people have already done about what they call airport security because it's just ridiculous. The right meeting itself was cool. No, I'm not going to give uh, 
overview of things I found interesting because, well, I found IPv6 interesting, of course, but other people find other th things more interesting. However, first thing that happened, the entire conference was packed with people and it was in London. London in November basically means everybody caught a cold, not because of the weather outside, but inside the building. It was so packed, they basically decided to turn the air conditioning down all the way. Minus five degrees Kelvin, that is. Half the people caught a cold. And um, so eventually I had to resort myself to getting some stupid cough medicine. Despite it being English, but whatever. Anyway, the one important thing to me at the conference was, of course, well, I was there for IPv6 all the time and at some point I was given a new badge. Yellow one means I'm now officially one of the IPv6 working group chairs. So I'm officially important now. Anyway, it was a nice conference and on the way back at the airport for some reason I forgot I accidentally put the cuff medicine into my day pack uh, hand baggage instead of the, the main baggage and uh, you're not supposed to carry liquids and what 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 so when i realized i had this i was kindly given this magic little device that turns a terrorist cough medicine into ordinary cough medicine yeah once i was past security i actually discovered some uh, gun running scheme or in the broadest possible sense i mean not only could you get these lethal and i mean lethal weapons just not just regular size but also the military grade one uh, these people are disguising themselves as pharmacists i mean i even got an oversized incendiary device they sell it as traditional scottish cuff medicine you get that past the airport security and it doesn't even fit the magic bag right so yeah crazy but anyway those are the things that happened oh and there's another thing another good thing that happened when i arrived in london i decided i want a sim card for my galaxy tab and i got this uh from three let's everybody see the name so it's all you can eat data with all you can eat data it says there for using any unlocked 3G or 4G phone. Worked fine. I paid 20 quids, like almost 30 euros on this. Should have been good for 30 days and I was only there for like seven. Stopped working after three. Message I got was this SIM card is for a smartphone, not for a tablet or PC. After three days. And if you've ever seen those Koreans, Japanese, Chinese in a place like London because I can't even read the road signs. Um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad for me because I can read and speak English and I know how to get to the subway and uh, or underground or tube or whatever they call it there and get back to where I want to go. But that was a, that was a mean stunt really. So three, if you think this is funny Maybe I should drop you off somewhere in Taiwan where you can't read the road signs and see how you fare there. So that was definitely a reason why I don't want to do business with these people if I can avoid it in the future. Okay, so much for today. And one more thing about the next episode. I still intend to do something on information theory which I promised in August. And back then I did at least a dozen runs on trying to record something and how it works and what it is and why it's important for random number generates and whatnot. And it never worked out. Why? Because if I explained it like all the textbooks, it's basically assuming that I have an audience who has at least the equivalent of a bachelor in computer science or even math uh, as far as the mathematical background is concerned and that doesn't work well 
I suppose some of you might actually have such sort of degree, but I'm not going to make any assumptions on that. However, I think I found a way to explain it that's more palatable and perfectly sufficient to have the background to decide if what these devices produces output is actually sound or not. And I'll see when I find the time to record something on that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did and watch this on YouTube, you do me a favor and give it a thumbs up. If you want to discuss if you have any other ideas on how to get rid of the FTDI design or if you know of somebody working on a replacement chip, microcontroller, whatever, please come over to the forum at www.stabletedishit.com slash bivblog slash 32. And in any case, hopefully see you again soon. Bye.